just a, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was talking to some people, or it might have been last week, and about vision. And we know that vision is very, very important. And for us here, it's, it's I guess, vision takes on different sort of concept in a lot of churches because the vision is perhaps uh, to build a sanctuary or the, the building program's their vision or that's their vision and they're, they're doing this and they're doing that. But, but really, our vision is very, very simple. So I just thought I'd write it down. And so I've, I've got some uh, there's at the back there if you want to take it home. But uh, Global Connections' vision is this, to prepare a house where the Holy Spirit has free access to move as He pleases. To prepare, to prepare an atmosphere where the gifts of the Spirit may operate freely, mainly the fivefold ministry for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Put up your hand if you're in the ministry. That's everybody. We're all there. Amen. Our focus is prayer, praise and worship, and the Word of God. Our desire is to see people come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, a place of healing, a place of deli deliverance. Our focus is to see the body of Christ come into unity. I meet with different pastors. We pray together. And I'm really believing for that to even grow further. Our mission is to provide for others that, go, as God leads us to, with financial support, with love and with prayer. To allow the Holy Spirit to lead us in the unfinished business God has in hand for the Sunshine Coast and to plant churches in other areas. The, uh, when I came back to the coast, I said, God, why do you want me to come back? He said, there's unfinished business. And uh, next Thursday... We, uh, we're going up to do one of our first plants up in uh, Agnes Waters. So that's next Thursday. We're going to start that. They're going to meet Thursday night for a period of time, and then they're going to start on Sundays. Uh, to put it simply, our vision is we just want God. Is that okay? Somehow, somewhere it would be nice to have a building to accommodate all our activities. Amen. And, and also we're looking at commencing a food bank. That's come into a few snags, but that's really good to have a few snags because without a fight, there's no victory. <laughs> Amen. How many people love Jesus today? Father, we want to just give you all the praise. We want to give you all the glory. You're our God. This is your idea, <laughs> not our idea. This is what you want. You Way, way back, you wanted a people. You wanted a people that you could be their dad, that you could supply all of their need according to your riches in glory, that you could be just a loving God that puts his loving arms around them and helps them through life. Father, we know that there was a catastrophe, but Lord, that didn't stop the plan of God. And Lord, we know today that there's a heaven. And Lord, we know today that you're preparing that place for us. And we want to just, while we're on this planet Earth, we want to be the best we can be for you in Jesus' name. Amen? That might mean overcoming some obstacles. Anybody here ever had an obstacle? Ever had a problem? Ever had an opportunity to blow it? Ever had an opportunity to get miserable? Ever had an opportunity to kick the dog? <laughs> to yell at somebody that drove past you too fast, or whatever. What we're doing at the, at the moment is we're believing for God to lay a foundation for us to really build our lives on, to build our faith on, to build whatever God wants to build on. As a builder, I, I know that if uh, you could be the greatest builder in the world, but if the foundations weren't solid, the house would crack. But also if the soil wasn't solid, wasn't prepared, you'd get cracks. The building would fail. So today I just want to open up, perhaps I'm going to start off very, very simple. But I believe that there'll be truths in what I'm going to share this morning that will activate something on the inside of you that will cause you to rise up. How many people want to rise up? Shake off some stuff. 
get rid of some wrong thinking and really see what God has for us. Knowing truth makes us free. We know that the blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We know that the name of Jesus delivers us from every attack of the enemy. We know that the stripes of Jesus heals us. The Bible says, by my stripes you are healed. These things were prophesied in the Old Testament and came to fulfillment in the New Covenant, the New Testament. How, how do we get saved? What, what do we got to do to get saved? You see, life itself, there's so many things you've got to do. If you want to be wealthy, you've got to do all this stuff. You got, if you want this, you've got to do that. But you see, to get saved, what do I got to do to get saved? I, I want, I'm trying to, this morning, I guess, break myths. I don't really have to be perfect. I don't have to struggle and strive. I, I don't have to be the one that, that's there with my eyes so tight and my hands so high and so forth like that and trying to act out a spiritual life. I don't have to be the one that, that's doing everything and everything to, to gain salvation. I simply just have to accept it. To receive it. Just to receive it, I have to receive the gift and the promise of salvation that was purchased for me on the cross of Calvary. How do I get it? How do I get healed? What have I got to do to get healed? Have I got to go to 75 prayer meetings? Have I got to do this? Have I got to do that? Have I got to do so many Hail Marys? Have I, what, what do I do to, to break through into this mystical thing that seems so far away at times? It's so far away because you can't do it yourself. You have to accept it. Jesus purchased something so dynamic and so powerful for us on the whipping pole. The Bible says, by the stripes of Jesus, by his wounds, we were healed. I guess it's the it's simplicity that confuses everybody. If Paris was here this morning, she is here, she's up with the children. This pen, <laughs> she covets my pen. You see, this pen is a Mount Blanc, or Blanc, or whatever you want to call it. It doesn't look much, but its value is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> Not, it doesn't write any better. It doesn't write any prof more prophetic, although I write most of my messages with this pen. It's over, worth over $400. And if I said to Paris, and you better be careful because she might hear me from upstairs, do you want this pen? She would run and she would grab it. Because nearly every Sunday she looks at it and she admires it. <laughs> you see, if I said to David, you want this pen? <laughs> God's not there saying, I don't want to give it to you. <laughs> He's not there saying, well, David, you've got to get lower, get better, and do this before, before you can have this pen. But if I said, David, would you like this pen? What are you going to do? <laughs> you've got, no, you got, you got to grab it. You have to grab it. Now, that was just demonstration only. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so simple. That the simplicity of it. You see, what we do is... We want to get healed, or we want to get this, or we want to get that. The, most people say about salvation, when you talk about them coming to church, that they say, I'm too bad. I'm no good. Well, there wasn't one of us here that wasn't too bad. <laughs> but the thing is that Jesus paid a price. And one day, a sinner like me and a sinner like you walked somewhere or said something, Jesus, I accept what you've done for me. Come into my life and heal me, save me, deliver me. So it's so simple. The Bible, I want you to, to read something here uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, For He made Him, God made Jesus, 
who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So simple, so easy. For this purpose was the Son of God made manifest, that He might destroy the works of Satan's. Jesus said, it's better for you if I go. I will send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost. Oh, what an amazing day that was. Let's just have a quick look at it in the book of Acts. I said I am going through some things there that are very, very fundamental. You all know these things. But friend, if we're going to go on, we've got to indelibly print some things in our life. Jesus spoke and He said, it's better for you that if I go, because if I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, the mighty Holy Spirit. The Bible says when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord, in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them divided tongues as of fire, and it sat on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together. They were confused because everyone heard them speak in their own language. This great phenomena, this great outpouring, this great anointing, it, it just came in, a, in an amazing way. He, he said, I'm going to send the comforter. It, it came with fire. It came with a mighty rushing wind. It came with noise. It came with supernatural manifestations. People speaking in other languages. People uh, being just so changed as, as in the atmosphere. People hearing, people uh, speaking a strange language, but somehow or other they understood everything that was being said. It was a supernatural outpouring of God's Spirit. What an amazing day. What an amazing time. Power came down. Power. Peter, who had, been, who had denied Jesus, who, who had denied Him three times, he was so fearful, so, so fearful of this crowd. Now he's in a massive crowd, even a greater crowd. But something's happened to him. He's now been filled with the Holy Spirit. The power of God has come upon his life. And Peter, uh, standing there, started to cry out and tell these people how they just killed Jesus. If you have a look in Acts 2.26, it says, You just killed the Son of God. You've killed the Son of God. Man, that would stir up a crowd. That would stir up people. that would get angry with you. The Holy Spirit not only come with great power. And sometimes when, when, we, when we think of the Holy Spirit, we think of the power of God. And that's good because that's a part of it. But something else happened that day when the outpouring of the Spirit came. The Holy Spirit also came with great conviction. Great conviction power. And friend, I want to tell you, if you pray, if you understand, and you understand what God has done and what God has made available for you, and the work of the Spirit, He said, when the Holy Spirit comes, He's going to do some things. The Holy Spirit's going to do some things. I'm going to read some scriptures in a minute. But friend, I want to tell you, the way I've been praying lately is totally different. I'm starting to say, Holy Spirit, you have a purpose on this life. Holy Spirit, it is your job. It is not my job to convict anybody or to convince anybody their need for Jesus Christ. That is the Holy Spirit's job. So you can ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, go and help these people. The Holy Spirit came with great conviction. In Acts 2 uh, verse 37, let's have a little look at that. Now when they heard this, they were cut to their hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to him, Repent and be baptized. You see, when the Holy Spirit comes, there was so much activity, so much things going on. The power of God was moving. There was a manifestation. Friend, I want to tell you, when the Holy Spirit comes to church, when He starts manifesting Himself in our presence, Things are going to start happening here, there, everywhere. Because that is the work of the Spirit. 
That's what God will do. He will raise people up. He will deliver people. He will convict people. He will challenge people. It's not my job up here to say, oh, well, now I'm going to pick Roma because she's a good lady. Now, I know Roma's got this major problem. I know that she's blah, 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 blah. She's got this problem. So I'm, I'm going to preach a message on Sunday that's going to get her. I saw, a, a, you know, there was, a, there was a, I've told this story before, but there was a man that came to church. And he sat in the church and, and he listened to the message. And at the end of the message, this pastor got up and made the altar call. And this man stood up and, and gave his life to Jesus. And at the, end of the mess, at the end of the day, he walked over to this man that just got saved. And he said, sir, he said, what part of my message, glory to God, what part of my message was so impacting <laughs> that it touched you and caused you to come to the Christ? And, and the guy said to him, well, as a matter of fact, sir, he said, I thought your message was quite boring. He said, but I was sitting in my seat with my hand, with just looking at the floor, thinking, how long is this going to go for? And there was a little girl on the floor coloring in. And on the top of the page of the coloring in book she had, it said, God loves you. <laughs> she said, he said, I read that. And he said, when I read that, he said, something happened on the inside. And just at that point, you said, who wants to give their life to Jesus? I said, me. <laughs> Who's catching my drift here? We can have all the... <clears throat> and everything, all our ducks in a row. But said, you see, if I'm aware, and if I'm convinced, that I know today that the mighty Holy Spirit comes in and, and power and, and He wants to work with us and in us and, and, and He will bring things to our memories and stuff like that. But also He wants to use us you go out and he, it's the Holy Spirit that will do the work. Not only came with power, but he came with great conviction. The Bible says in Acts 2, 20, uh, 41, it says that 3,000 people got saved that day. What an amazing thing. I want you to have a look at John 16 with me, if you will. I need a bigger pulpit. <laughs> John 16. It says this, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's verse 7 I'm reading from. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if, but if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will what? Convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more of judgment because the ruler of the world is judged. I still have many things uh, to say to you, but you cannot hear them. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you of things to come. We need the Holy Spirit, friend. We need a move of the Holy Spirit. Great conviction, convictions come. The Bible tells us, in uh, 1 Corinthians 2.9, it says, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love Him. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For no man knows the ways of man except the Spirit of man that is in him. Neither will any man know the ways of the Spirit except the Spirit of God that's in him. Friend, we need a dose of the ghost. Amen. We need a dose of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. God reveals things to His people. God speaks and reveals His purpose to us through His Spirit, through His Word, revelation, work of the Spirit. God loves you. The, rev the Spirit gets on it. Spirit of God gets on the Word. Well, we ask God by His Spirit, will you come? Will you come? Will you come? 
Will you, will you, I, I just don't want to preach another message. But Holy Spirit, will you water it? Will you, will you feed it? Will you take it? Will you break it? Will you divide it? Will you give it to the people? But one of the greatest things that, that ever happens is that while I'm feeding you, I've already dined at the table. <laughs> it's already impacted my life. It's already touched my life. I don't want to preach a message that's, that hasn't impacted my life. I don't want to preach a message that I'm not excited to preach. I don't want to preach something that, that's just going to tickle your ears. I want the Holy Spirit to be on it. The prophetic is the work of the Spirit. To neglect the work of the Holy Spirit, I likened it to not putting fuel in your car and expecting it still to run. Amen? It's okay to say amen in this Pentecostal Presbyterian church. The Holy Spirit is the manager, the overseer of God's church on planet Earth. He is the manager, the overseer of God's church on planet Earth. You need to be led by the Spirit, not by me. I fear sometimes when people come up to me with, with things. Peter, where are you? You might be up there doing children's shit. But Peter come up and asked me something the other day, and, and man, I, I, I don't, I don't want to answer that. Ashley Samira came to me one, one time many, many years ago and he said, Neil, I feel that God has called me to England. I said, that's good. He walked away. Six or eight weeks later, might have been even more long, might have been six months, he rang me up. He said, Neil, I cannot get it out of my system. God has told me to go to England. I said, great, when do you want to go? He said, well, last time I talked to you, you didn't encourage me at all. I said, no, because I didn't want you to think that I sent you. Because when you got over there and you get into trouble, and as sure as God made little apples, you're going to get into trouble. <laughs> you're going to get mad with me for sending you to England. I said, now you know it wasn't me, it was God. Now you got any problem, talk to him. <laughs> he still lives in England today. Got to be led by the Spirit, not by me. So what we do is, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to convict and He's going to convince and He's going to do everything. And here we are, the church, what do we do? We just sit around waiting for the rapture. Singing a few songs, hallelujah. Give God a tip now and then. Get a little, hear the pennies fall, everyone for Jesus, da 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 No, 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 by the hair of my chin and chin chin, that won't get you in. <laughs> that won't get you in. You see, there is a devil who is a thief who wants to rob, kill, and destroy. He goes around like a roaring lion, if you remember our little phrase we started some time back. Seeking whom he made a vow, but he is not the roaring lion. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He goes around seeking whom he may empower. God, oh man, that was good. See, see. <laughs> Shaka bundi. I, I, I might even. <laughs> My people perish for lack of knowledge, the Bible says. James 5.16. Let's have a quick look at that. Is it all right to read the Bible in church? Hallelujah. 
It says, confess your sins or trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I'm going to talk a little bit about this today. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Fervent. The original meaning of fervent means boiling, burning, or glowing. Fervent means, can I hear it? Come on, give me a little bit of that. Amen, brother. Boiling, burning, <laughs> glowing. That's what fervent means, amen. Modern translation means passionate, intense feeling. So let's get hot for God in prayer. Let passion for the kingdom burn with intensity. Amen? Oh, glory to God. Chris uh, Shadbolt, a friend of mine who was a missionary in Africa, says this. People in Africa who were previously in witchcraft said, when Christians prayed, everybody say, when Christians prayed, the atmosphere got too hot for the demons to work with their curses and spells. He said the demons had to leave. This only happens through prayer. These people got convicted to Christ, got converted rather to Christ, and now attend the church they came to curse. Ben Budo, a pastor from Vanuatu, also a friend of mine, tells me of a man who was a chief witch doctor. He would travel with demons in the spirit realm and attack people and churches. They tried to attack a COC church in Loganville. He, the witch doctor, said there was a wall of fire all around the church, all around the people, and all around the pastor. And they could not enter or get into them. He realized there was a greater power than he possessed, so he became a Christian. <laughs> Amen. 2 Kings 6.14. Let's have a look at that. 2 Kings 6.14. What's all this fire stuff? What's all this stuff you're talking about? This is a man that was doing amazing things for God. The king, the opposing king, sent an army to Dothan after him. It says, Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, if I, if I just said that to you and you say, Ah, oh, yeah, that's okay. But Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open the eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes and the young man of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Horses and chariots. Yes, they had horses and chariots, but they didn't have horses and chariots of fire. Amen? All around were horses and chariots of fire. The Syrians had those things. In Zechariah 2.5 it says, for I, for I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her. And I will be the glory in her midst. We know that it's talking about Jerusalem. No, we're talking about this great nation of God. But I also believe that it comes down to the church as well. This little nation in the middle of, of all around us, surrounded by other nations that, that gnash their teeth and so furious and so angry and so bitter. War upon war upon war has come upon that nation. 
They've tried to eliminate them. They've everything. Hitler tried to annihilate them. There's been a been a thing against it. But they can't. They can't. They can't and they never will. Because God has got a wall of fire around it. Amen. A wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. And I'm believing, friend, that supernatural power, supernatural anointing of God, when the, if there is another war which is brewing, but I guarantee you that as those armies try to march in, they're going to see something so dynamic and they're going to see something so powerful. They're going to see the glory of the Lord. They're going to see the angels of God with fire in their midst. They're going to see horses and chariots. And I want to tell you that those armies are just going to run and flee in terror at the presence of the Lord. Hebrews 1.7, speaking of his angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his ministers servants, in other words, flames of fire. I don't know about you, but I want that. Speaking of his angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his ministers, servants, I just put servants there in brackets because that's what I believe ministers are. Sometimes we think that you've got to have a back to front collar on. Sometimes we think you've got to have so many degrees that they call you Dr. Fahrenheit. Somebody thinks you've got to have so many, I've been to so many this and so many that. I don't care where you've been, but if you've been to Jesus. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing flow? Are you washed in the blood? Are you full of the Holy Ghost fire? Have you let the fire of God? I want the fire of God to be around me, amen? I, I want to glow. I, what's that? Where's fervent? What's fervent? Glowing? Glory to God. I can't find it somewhere there. Jesus. Makes his angels spirits and his ministers flames of fire. Friends, there are fallen angels, devils. We know that a third of them fell, but there are God's angels, God's spirits. When we pray, when we pray, oh, we're just bashing our gums together. Oh, God, we just having such a bad day. Arthritis is playing up and bunions are sticking out and my back is killing me. Oh, God. <laughs> the fervent prayer of a righteous man, fervent, glorious, on fire, speaking the truth. Hallelujah. Amen. Power of God. Oh, shaka bundi. <laughs> when, we, when we pray, everybody say, when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Heaven comes with his angels of fire. Hallelujah. So much so, I believe that it will cause demons, demons that want to bind and afflict people to leave, run in terror. Fervent prayer. Every revival that I've ever read about, when they talk about it, they describe it as fire breaking loose. I want to encourage you, friends. I want to say, let's stoke the fire. You could have, you might have missed an opportunity this morning, but I, would, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, because my knower knows that there would have been people in this meeting this morning as we were singing, as we were praising, as we were worshipping, something of the Spirit of God would have been around your life and it would have contacted with you, it would have connected with you, it would have touched something on the inner, inner most being, it would have lifted you up out of whatever, it would have taken you to another dimension. Friend, there's only one way to get the victory and that's on the road with the Spirit of God. Let the Spirit of God take it. You could be depressed, but then the Bible says, lift up those hands that hang down. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Give glory to God. Thanks be unto God who always causes me to triumph. Pam was talking to me this morning. She said, Neil, she said, the presence of God is so she said, I get out of bed and she goes to wherever she goes to pray. 
<coughs> and in her mind, she's thinking, are you going to be here again? Will you? Because you see, when you walk in, it's just another day. It's just another walk. It's just another thing. But as you walk in, and as you lift up those hands that hang down, and as you lift your heart to heaven, glory comes down. No, heaven comes down, and glory fills my soul. Hallelujah. I walk into my office some days there, and I'm thinking, God, God, God. What was, well, you know, what, what, where? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, what I, what I started my message with, I just went into my office the other day and I just sat there and all of a sudden it was like the power of God and I just took out my, my Mount Blanc. <laughs> and I just started to write. I just started to write. Because he's there. Waiting. Fervent prayer of a righteous man. Let me just find that again if I can. The fervent prayer of a righteous man. Fervent, the original meaning, boiling, burning, glowing. You ever heard anybody say to you, there's a glow after you've been with God? Come on, you don't have to be so super spiritual. And it's not the sparkles you put on or whatever you call it. Got nothing to do with Max Factor. It's got everything to do with the God Factor. <laughs> that was a good one, eh? <laughs> uh, boiling, burning, glowing. Passionate, intense feeling. Let's get hot for God in prayer. Let passion for the kingdom burn with intensity. I believe God is looking for a people. Fire goes before Him. 